So, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are Zooming in from in the world. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. And for those of you who have, attend have attended before, of course, welcome back. My name is Dr Emily Jones and I am a lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Essex and I am of course the co-founder and co-convener along with the wonderful Dr Megan Wong of the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. I am delighted to be your host for today's special event with our four exceptional speakers, you can see them all on your screen. So we have Judge Maria Teresa infanti Cathy, Professor Malgosia Fitzmorris, Professor Patricia galval Teles and Professor Fontini Parizis. Um, and I will defer to Dr. Wong, uh, today's chair, to introduce our speakers properly. Um, but in my role as host, I wanted to speak a little bit more about the series itself, the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. So our series was founded earlier this year and inaugurated by Professor Niels Blocker, who is chair of the International Institutional Law at the University of Leiden and former deputy legal advisor to the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The series is built upon two important intellectual traditions in public international law, formalism and international legal practice and international legal theory, including post-colonial and feminist perspectives. The idea for this series stems very much from the friendship between Dr. Wong and I and is inspired by our respect for one another's scholarship and research. We're both generalist public international lawyers. But we have spe several specialist interests, including mutual interests in areas such as international environmental law, international law of the sea and the law of the use of force. But we write from very different approaches. I'm a critical legal scholar and Dr. Wong is a formalist. And the series therefore seeks to bridge the divide between these two approaches while showcasing a range of work from across the spectrum of scholarship within public international law. So we've had a fantastic year and this term we were joined by several amazing speakers. Um, so we started the term off with Professor Karen Knopp of the University of Toronto, who was followed by Professor Attila Tanzi, who is Chair of Public International Law at the University of Bologna, where we had a response from Dr. Nolifa Oral, who is Director of the Centre for International Law at National University of Singapore, and of course, member of the UN International Law Commission. This was then followed by a lecture by Professor Naz Modizadeh from Harvard Law School, who was followed by Judge Ida Caracciolo of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. We then had Osvaldo Urita, legal advisor to Chile on fisheries and ocean affairs and of Universidad Católica de Vasparezo, and Judge Eric Venestrom of the European Court of Human Rights. And finally, last week, we were joined by Professor Anne Orford of Melbourne Law School, who spoke about her new book, which literally also came out last week, International Law and the Politics of History, which was just published with Cambridge University Press. So this is our um, final event of the academic year. And of course, we have a particularly fantastic lineup for you, as you can all see. And I, Dr. Wong and I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers, um, including, of course, those joining us today and those who joined us this term and last term, and our fantastic audience for joining us. It's been great to have you all with us and thank you for asking great questions too. We'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Matthew Stone, who is our head of school at Essex, for supporting us in starting and running this series, as well as our colleagues in the School of Law more widely, who have been really enthusiastic and supportive of Dr. Wong and I. A special thanks, of course, has to go to Catherine Freeman in our events team, without whom the series and its success would certainly have not been possible, and to all of the events team as well. And finally, I wanted to extend my personal gratitude, of course, to Dr. Megan Wong. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you this past year, Dr. Wong, and I have learned an enormous amount from you, and I really could not have imagined running this series with anyone else, so thank you. So without further ado, I will now introduce you to today's chair, who is, of course, Dr. Megan Wong. Dr. Wong is a lecturer at the School of Law and the founding director of the LLM and International Law. And this was actually founded, a degree that was founded during the pandemic, which you can imagine is quite a feat, so she's done very well there. Um, Dr. Wong holds a PhD in public international law from Leiden University and is a generalist public international lawyer who has advised states on a range of issues and international law, including the law of treaties, international courts and tribunals, and international institutional law. 
And together with our speaker today, Professor Malgota Fitzmaurice and Joseph Crampin, she is also the co-author of a forthcoming Cases and Materials, an international environmental law book, which is forthcoming with Edward Elgar Publishing. And this book emphasizes international environmental lawmaking through customary law, and in particular, conventional law. Dr. Wong is also the author of a forthcoming monograph with Cambridge University Press entitled Responsibility of State and Individuals, Aggression at the International Criminal Court. So a fascinating book to look forward to there. So without further ado, Dr. Wong, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for the kind introduction. It is an honor to be in the company of such extraordinary international lawyers. And whilst I am on the note of extraordinary international lawyers, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Jones for co-founding this lecture series with me. Well, one day, two friends who love public international law decided to start a public international law lecture series and start a series we did. So this academic year, I've had the pleasure of co-teaching with Dr. Jones, co-convening and co-chairing the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series, but also following her research and speaking engagements with respect. So thank you, Emily, for your friendship and for being my co-founder of this amazing lecture series. And now to all our guests, welcome to our closing event for the academic year. I am pleased to chair this panel entitled Modern Challenges in International Law with our impressive speakers, Judge Maria Teresa Infanti Cuffey, Professor Malgosha Fitzmaurice, Professor Patricia Gavol Teles, Professor Fotini Pazardzis. Before I introduce each speaker and the title of their presentations, let me go through a few housekeeping rules. Each panelist will speak for about 15 minutes, and then I will open the floor to the panelists to comment on each other's presentations and to engage with each other, and then I will open the floor for Q&A. You may ask a question in the Q&A box, and I will read out your name and affiliations unless you opt to be anonymous. We start with Judge Maria Teresa Infanti Kafi. Judge Kafi will be speaking about engaging in a global legal scenario from a regional perspective, partnership, and coherence. We are privileged to have her speak on this topic today as indeed within international regional settings, Judge Kathy has played instrumental roles in making, shaping and teaching international law from professor to former director of frontiers and limits of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, ambassador and now judge. Um, so she has also been co-agent for Chile in disputes before the International Court of Justice in several cases, namely maritime dispute, Peru and Chile, obligation to negotiate access to the Pacific Ocean, Bolivia, Chile, status and use of waters of the Silala, Chile and Bolivia. And in her capacity as former ambassador of Chile to the Netherlands, she has also played a role in two very important multilateral settings the Assembly of State Parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and permanent representative to the Organization for the Provision of Chemical Weapons. Judge Professor Kathy is also a director of the Institute of International Studies of the University of Chile and is a member of the Institut Droit International. And now we come to Professor Malgosha Fitzmaurice, who holds a chair of public international law at Queen Mary University of London. This year, she's being awarded the title of honorary doctorate for her outstanding achievements in academia at the University of Neuchâtel. Congratulations, Professor Fitzmaurice. She's an associate member of the Institut de Droit International. And we all know that the name Professor um, Malgosha Fitzmaurice is synonymous with the law of treaties and international environmental law in which she is a leading light in both these streams. She has published widely in these streams and her scholarship is renowned for its strong emphasis on state practice concerning the evolution of the law of treaties. Today, she draws upon her expertise across both these streams to speak to us about international environmental law, conferences of the parties, flexibility and legitimacy. It is worth noting her recent book, The Treaties in Motion, The Evolution of Treaties from Formation to Termination, co-authored with Panos Makuris with Cambridge University Press, which is extensive in its coverage of um, analysis of international environmental law and the law of treaties. And of course, 
her monograph, Whaling and International Law with Cambridge University Press. Uh, Professor Patricia Gavoteles is a member of the U United Nations International Law Commission and Associate Professor of International Law at the Autonomous University of Lisbon. She will speak to us today on challenges to international lawmaking in a globalized and polarized, polarized world. When it comes to international lawmaking, Professor Gavoteles has played an extensive and varied role. As a legal advisor to the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, she has been involved in the negotiation of bilateral and multilateral treaties in the context of the UN Six Committee. Of note, Professor, uh, Professor Gabriel Teles was also responsible for preparing the accession of Portugal to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, 1969, and where she was legal advisor to the Portuguese representation to the European Union in Brussels, she participated in the negotiation of several dossiers regarding the implementation of the Treaty of Lisbon. Another important multilateral setting that she has participated in is the Assembly of State Parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court as a member of the Portuguese delegation. In the interstate setting, Professor Gabriel Teles is also a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration for Portugal's national group and has been involved as part of the Portuguese delegation in the East Timor and Kosovo legality of the use of force cases before the International Court of Justice. And at the International Law Commission, she is an active member and co-chair of the study group on sea level rise in relation to international law. She has only very recently been elected as chair of the drafting committee. It is the first time that a female member of the International Law Commission is carrying out this function and it entails chairing meetings most afternoons on nearly all topics on the agenda. And in light of this hybrid Zoom world we live in, truly a remarkable feat. Congratulations, Patricia, for holding this position and doing the remarkable work that you do um, for the International Law Commission. And now Professor Fatini Pazartsis is Professor of International Law and Director of the Athens Public International Law Center at the Faculty of Law of the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens. Many of us will remember them as the organizers and hosts of the 2019 European Society of International Law Conference, of which Professor Pazartsis is the President of the European Society of International Law and member of the ESOL board. She's a member of the UN Human Rights Committee and was very recently elected as chair earlier this year. Congratulations. Also, as the human, UN Human Rights Committee sessions are ongoing at present, we thank Professor Pazartis for taking the time out of her busy schedule to be with us today. She speaks to us on adjudicating state responsibility for internationally wrongful acts, the ILC's articles in recent practice, and of note, we recall her Hague Academy lecture on reparation and international adjudication, which she delivered in July 2018. And now I would like to um, open the floor for our panel discussion today. If we could start with Judge Kathy, if you would like to start your presentation. And of course, congratulations on your recent election to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Thank you very much. Good morning in Chile, good afternoon in Europe, and good evening as well. Uh, I would like to thank the program for this invitation and to congratulate Dr. Jones and Dr. Wong for these splendid panels organized in the past month. Uh, they have given a deep sight of international law, which is fully present in international community. Today's invitation aims to reflect on future challenges of international law. The title has given me the opportunity to refer to selected themes that emerge either from theoretical perspectives or from the practice in Latin America without exhausting the list of topics uh, or theoretical approaches that are present in the region. Latin America is not apart from the world agenda. On the contrary, many discussions taking place uh, worldwide resonate within the region, as it can be seen through the participation in international fora, such as ANCITRAL, the International Law Commission, the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly, and engagements uh, adopted uh, within the agenda, SDGs agenda. Uh, also in the academia, associations are a good place to participate and to assess the Latin American interests 
and postulates. At present, at the same time, in our domestic environment, international law is subject to debate. More about its content, hierarchy, limits, and justiciability than about its regional or global status. In this sense, uh, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is an expression of this characteristic. Let us uh, recall the consultative opinion that was uh, rendered uh, a few years ago on the environment and human rights uh, that reflects this approach. My presentation today will review some aspects related to challenges stemming from issues that exceed the internal sphere and which are present in current international debates and negotiations. It's also important, it is also important to take into account that there is a tendency to connect doctrines aiming to explain the wide and evolving political and economic scenarios in our societies with international law as it stands today. And I was very glad uh, to hear that you reflect different, uh, Megan and, and, and Emily reflect different positions in international law, different doctrinal approaches towards international law, because it is also reflect in our uh, Latin American uh, practice and doctrine. Uh, this presentation will uh, focus on subjects and cross-cutting issues that appear to be present, more present in Latin American with today. I'm aware that the analysis is not exhaustive and that although several other issues may appear related to the region, they will be omitted for the sake of concession. For example, gender issues, foreign debt, and other uh, issues that are being negotiated or debated. Institutionalization of international law, or, or better said, the affirmation that there are common principles applicable in the whole continent, has historically been regarded as a political response to asymmetric relations in the Americas. That is uh, something that has been accepted or agreed uh, uh, throughout the years. Uh, International law uh, has been conceived as an instrument to create a, a, a sort of level playing field. In this respect, effort to promote the consolidation of a regional normative corpus to foster an agreed understanding about principles and norms have been part of the hemispheric uh, history. Uh, on the other hand, it is not contested that connections between political and diplomatic initiatives throughout the 20th century served to test the compatibility with, between a regional legal interest and general international law. Let us recall the question of human rights, the economic order, independence and non-intervention, and so on. Even the concept of an American international law in early years of the, the century was more an attempt to innovate than to break with the legal world. So there was the search of a compatibility, but from an independent vision. To the extent that these theories and initiatives have survived over the years, it still resonates the issue of the affirmation of independence in a broad sense, as the identity of a Latin American presentation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the world. Uh, an example of this uh, characteristic was the reformist approach uh, uh, presented or putting by uh, the jurist, famous jurist Alejandro Alvarez and the perspective of, of arbitration and international courts, universal or regional, and so on. Latin American scholars and practitioners are constantly subject then to tensions regarding the contribution of regional perception and trends to the construction of a cohesive world. But this is more a doctrinal debate than a, a, a practical one. In recent years, Latin American positions have been mostly interrogated from the perspective of its engagement with the so-called liberal international order. This is an issue that emerges out of the elaboration of general rules, but is also related to the evolution of existing rules through regional and sub-regional practices and decisions. For example, the participation on free trade agreements or the elaboration of common rules to deal with foreign investments. It is a process uh, that we can uh, qualify as a continuity and change. On the environmental camp, 
a good example of adaptation to a wider discussion through a regional instrument is the regional agreement on access to information, public participation and justice in environmental matters in Latin America and the Caribbean, Caribbean uh, which is a long title, adopted in, in 2018 uh, and enforced in 14 uh, countries. The objective of this instrument is to guarantee the implementation in Latin America and the Caribbean of the rights of access to environmental information, public participation in the environmental decision-making process, and access to justice in environmental matters, and the creation and strengthening of capacities and cooperation, while contributing to the protection of the rights of every person of present and future generations to live in a healthy environment and to sustainable development. This very long explanation uh, gives us an overarching view of broadly supported uh, principles and goals uh, uh, across uh, the region. But rather, but the implications in terms of international relations and dispute settlement for participating parties have been more debated. There is also the question of the development of further obligations such as the reversal of the burden of proof and a dynamic approach toward the subject. So this is an example in which the region has taken a, a, an approach that was already adopted in another region, transposed to the, to the continent or to the subcontinent, and then adapted with new um, or updated with new tools to deal with the question of access to justice and access to information. With uh, the consequences that some states uh, do not understand very well how to deal with this new uh, trend uh, that, that had been agreed upon, uh, by the way. Uh, to what extent then uh, new problems that are now present worldwide are transposed to Latin America? Is there any difference uh, when the perspective is taken from the, from the region? This is something we, we can debate uh, later on. I would like to say that uh, I was very uh, surprised that uh, looking at the studies conducted by the Inter-American Juridical Committee, which is one body of the, Inter -Ameri of the American Organization of American States, little differences may be found in the way the committee deals with subjects of regional concern and while uh, uh, um, uh, receiving or accepting uh, to deal with subjects that uh, uh, may uh, be of general concern. One example is the treatment of cyber and the question of non-state actors. The report prepared by Professor Hollis tells us that part of the problem in applying international law to cyberspace derives from the lack of tailor-made rules or standards, but there is no issue of a re pure regional approach towards the subject. I think this is a very uh, attractive subject to, to study, and uh, but I'm not going to dig uh, on that at this stage. Uh, so the question of a general international law applicable to this question of cyberspace uh, depends more on analogizing with more or to more general multilateral treaties no distinction between a regional or global approach. So while there is a doctrine explaining why we engage uh, with international law or in international law, at the same time, the committee shows uh, a pattern of uh, a more uh, uh, adhering to a more cohesive uh, way of thinking uh, legal, uh, legal thought. I would like to highlight two areas of interest that are currently being debated in Latin America or by Latin American states, although not uh, from a regional, pure regional perspective, it is more a national perspective, but that it correspond to other national perspectives. So there is a kind of symmetry in the way states are debating or discussing these issues. One is the question of investments and trade issues and questions of application of international law domestically. It corresponds, the subject corresponds to a moment in which there are political and institutional uh, uh, moments in several Latin American countries, either to reform institutions 
or to introduce new perspectives in the constitutional and institutional uh, process. This is very important. For example, Chile is one of the actors uh, in, in that respect, and there are some other Latin American countries also debating about it. Uh, the current uh, challenge uh, in this sphere relates to the regulatory space of the state, how much, so how much sovereign the state is, and the adoption and conduction of public policies when dealing with economic matters. Economy is one of the building blocks, of course, of the state, because it provides not only the means, but it is also a way to um, uh, behave uh, with and to conduct uh, social and, and public uh, issues uh, in a very uh, thorough and stable manner. It is about the ability to adopt domestic legislation and administrative decisions that may override existing agreed rules and operate contrary to international established legal rules. That is the question. Uh, can states uh, be or separate from established legal rules that have been adopted through treaties, international agreements, which are binding upon them? Discussions taking place in Latin America and in other continents about the value and normative character of international law in the economic sphere are indicative that, uh, that uh, it is an issue, there is an issue of validity and compliance to be addressed, uh, addressed by jurists and policymakers. Regarding trade and investment agreements, there is also a simplification in the, in the approach. Uh, when we say that uh, it is inherent to them to be developed in a fragmented normative order. So there is a fragmentation through these international agreements. Uh, they, they, uh, um, some authors or some views uh, uh, say that there will always follow a path that takes distance with other developments in international law. For example, human rights, labor laws, environment, and so on. This fragmented view is not about regional universal, it is more about uh, chapters or, or silos, of, uh, silos in international law. I, this is not my view, but I think this is a good way to look at other areas of international law that may be confronted from the perspective of free trade and investment agreements. Uh, it is often controverted. Uh, 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 that uh, the evolution and execution of trade agreements uh, do not, uh, does not keep the pace of the evolution of other standards and rules in international law. Uh, this, is, this is something that is, this, uh, uh, is theoretically, uh, theoretically discussed and analyzed, but uh, in some areas or uh, according to some um, uh, practices and, and the renovation of the law applicable to international trade uh, shows that states are very conscious of the challenges and the need to introduce more balanced clauses and more balanced views in the agreements that are signed uh, uh, with countries that belong to different uh, develop, developing uh, uh, or developed level uh, or levels of development and regions. How to counter these critical approaches? Critical approaches regarding imbalances. Well, the question is how to empower domestic institutions, including courts and administrative organs, to deal with the application and enforcement of the agreed set of rules. Another question is that uh, to value the role of adv advisory bodies. Um, not only uh, social, socio-economic bodies, but also uh, bodies that represent uh, labor uh, forces and other stakeholders, domestic stakeholders. Conflicts between human rights and domestic and foreign investments is something that comes up from time to time in the region. And uh, some disputes have shown clearly which are the limits of these instruments to deal with those issues. It is a political question. It's also a legal responsibility to uh, tackle uh, them. 
uh, it is use, useful to look at scenarios where it is possible to assess which are the interactions between policies and business responsibility. This is something which is very important. I have been uh, 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 reading uh, a report which is a, a proposal by the OECD, um, uh, which uh, tries to reconcile these areas, which is a very uh, interesting approach, uh, even for developing countries and for Latin American countries that are members of the organization. Uh, it is the ability from trade and investment treaties to support domestic environmental labor or human rights laws and areas such as, such as gender perspectives uh, and uh, the role those areas have in economic growth and, uh, and uh, to adopt responsive policies to sustain development. Um, the, the test of, the, of, the, of those agreements would be very high in those areas. I would be uh, glad to discuss this uh, further on in this panel. Uh, there is an evolutive, evolutive approach on the side of these agreements. And I must say that we are seeing that there are specialized chapters on environment and labor in several free trade agreements. The issue is about investment treaties, where they can look at the areas and, and uh, keep the pace with evolution uh, in those, in those uh, um, other areas. Uh, new clauses on gender, for example, have been uh, included in some free trade treaties. Chile signed an agreement with Uruguay a few years ago where uh, gender related rules and, and gender empowerment, equality and cooperation activities have been envisioned. Um, uh, the fact that some of these clauses uh, can be characterized as hortatory does not uh, deprive them of relevance in terms of interpretation and effective application of the standards of protection of those rights. Let us move to a second area in which Latin America is very active and in which I see this uh, intertwined uh, or intertwining uh, uh, intertwined process of, of uh, relationship between Latin America and the uh, global uh, discussion, which is, not, which is not unified, by the way. It is, it is being uh, built, it is in the process of being built, but it has not achieved yet a final outcome. And it will, may take uh, some years uh, uh, yet. It is the, the effort of constructing constructing a global regime for biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. This is an issue of high sensitivity in our countries and worldwide. It is a, a national, a regional, and also a global issue. Why is it so? Because of the weight we uh, 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 put or we assign to certain instruments that are already in force, especially the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and at the same time, the interactions with other regimes that may be applicable to these areas where this uh, biodiversity is present. Uh, uh, you know, and as uh, we, know, we all know, that regional groups and special associations, such as small islands, developing countries, are among the most uh, important stakeholders in this res respect. There is a, a, a draft text, which is a pre-draft text, but it is, it is very well crafted uh, under the leadership of a, a very able diplomat and jurist, um, Ambassador Lee. Uh, and uh, the, the areas that are covered here uh, in, the, in the draft depict uh, a picture, uh, show a picture in which not only problems, but also interactions between regimes are very present. And this is the opportunity for, this has been the opportunity for a, a core Latin American group to be an effective tool of coordination, uh, dissemination and uh, adaptation uh, to uh, adopt common positions. I would like to highlight two areas before finalizing my presentation, 
and given the opportunity to my colleagues to continue with the panel. Two or three points. First, which are, which are uh, very uh, key issues for Latin, some Latin American countries or for all Latin American countries for different reasons. First, relationship between the future agreement with relevant or existing legal instruments and frameworks. First, there is the question of uh, Latin American countries that do not participate in the United Nations Convention uh, of the Law of the Sea. That is one issue that uh, is reflected in certain positions adopted, for example, the, the uh, introduction of general principles that may be um, or that stem from uh, the UN Convention or dispute settlement and other issues. There are questions also of uh, the adjacency between continental chef and high seas and so on. This is of high relevance for uh, Latin American countries. There is another aspect of this question. It is the, uh, the issue of the Antarctic Treaty System and the future uh, uh, agreement that will deal with biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. As the Antarctic Treaty System poses that issue of what is national jurisdiction or what is the common jurisdiction of the system as such, this is another uh, uh, issue. Are related areas, but I'm not going to uh, 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 dig on, on them. Uh, a second point is the question of area-based man management rules. Here, I would like to say that I see that there are at least two dimensions that are of particular interest uh, in Latin America. It is the uh, relationship between uh, marine protected areas and the future competence of a conference to adopt these uh, uh, management uh, tools or area-based management management tools and already existing marine protected areas. The compatibility uh, can be obtained through uh, a very a coherent set of rules. And I think nobody is, is, uh, is uh, playing in the sense to counter or to oppose the possibility of having these tools. Uh, it seems to me that Latin America would like to have a different, we use a different word instead of tools. Um, and uh, the question of high seas fishing. Uh, our distinguished jurist Urrutia addressed this issue uh, some weeks ago. I'm very glad that, uh, that uh, he explained some of the consequences of, the, of this uh, kind of legal overlap that may happen between the protection of biodiversity and fishing without uh, uh, um, speaking with each other. That is a, a, a second question, very important one. And there are some different views. I have seen uh, a, a, a document, a, a proposal made or a comment made by one Latin American country, Central American country, opposing the idea of considering the fishing in the agreement or trying to uh, include fishing in the future agreement. And some other countries say, no, we oppose, uh, we have to respect already existing uh, management, uh, regional man management organization, uh, fishing organization. And that is, uh, that is the question. And the third, uh, uh, and third issue is ad adjacency. This is absolutely of paramount importance. Uh, the ecosystem approach, which is uh, part of the of the future, which will be part of the future regime, the ecosystem approach will take into account adjacent economic spaces or maritime spaces. What what adjacency uh, will mean uh, to uh, comply with this uh, uh, new regime? This is very important because it will have a practical consequence uh, in the in the sphere of the environmental impact assessment uh, mechanism. And there the importance of the non-prejudice uh, idea that uh, activities conducted in one area uh, will not have to prejudice, will have to take into account the non-prejudice principle or criterion. Uh, this is something to discuss further. And the, the fourth and last point I would like to, to mention 
regarding the uh, uh, ongoing uh, or uh, or this subject which is ongoing in the international uh, on international scenario is the question of dispute settlement this is very important at the beginning i thought it would be very simple we could just take the model of certain conventions especially the un convention uh, or the law of the sea and to take other uh, models and to say for example the um, fishing stock agreements and so on and to see how to uh, these uh, activities new activities will uh, uh, fit into that and then to supplement with uh, some ideas but i think political trends diplomatic discussion show otherwise some states are reluctant to adopt as, as such approaches that have already been uh, agreed uh, on because of the non-participation in those, those regimes. So that is one point. The second point is the question of compulsory uh, dispute settlement mechanism. And the third point is the need to diversify the mechanisms according to the nature and the, the, uh, the actors and the subjects that uh, may be involved in different sort of uh, disputes, including intellectual property, uh, traditional knowledge, access to genetic resources uh, disputes. With this, I would like to stop and I thank you for your patience. I have maybe I have given some uh, very, uh, uh, how can I say, conf confusing ideas or, or uh, too specific, but I will. I wanted to highlight where uh, uh, Latin America stands today and what are the real issues, among others, that I have omitted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Kaffee, for that very rich and enlightening presentation and for sharing with us your views on the Latin American approaches and perspectives. If Professor Fitzmaurice, if you would like to now have the floor for your presentation. Yeah. I would like to first, first congratulate uh, Dr. Jones and uh, Dr. Wong for initiating such stimulating and significant series of meetings of international law. And also thank both of them for giving me opportunity to participate in your concluding event. Um, so I am going to talk, as uh, Dr. M. Wong already mentioned, about international environmental law conferences of the parties, flexibility and legitimacy. This is just an excuse, the title, to give me the opportunity to go to law of treaties, of course, but before I do it, I would like to introduce the panelists and also the audience to the um, phenomenon of multilateral environmental agreements, which developed exponentially in the last years, such as Climate Change Convention, Kyoto Protocol, the Biodiversity Convention, um, ESPO Convention, uh, Basel Convention on Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Wares, and very important, for instance, CITES Convention on Trade in Endangered Species of Animals and Plants. And all these conventions, multilateral environmental agreements, they are global conventions, so they are very important. The, these conventions have a top uh, body, which are called conferences of the parties and meetings of the parties. And um, meetings of the parties, I subsumed to conference of the parties because I noted in my other presentations that COPS, MOPS, it sort of makes a very linguistic hurdle to uh, overcome. So let's call them COPS. So these conferences of the parties um, were fairly unknown phenomenon until some years ago, um, Professor Churchill and Ulstein published a very uh, seminal article, article in 
uh, American Journal of International Law, in which they turn attention of international community of states to very um, extensive powers of conferences of the parties. Um, these offers called conferences of the parties, um, the, um, uh, they, uh, they, call, they called it autonomous institutional arrangements. And from this name already, we can see that these conferences have quite um, a number of functions. So not all functions were without, um, uh, without um, consent of the parties and they were also subject of very many um, contradictory statements. So what are the functions of these conferences of the parties? They are quite extensive. So most of them are, are enumerated in a multilateral environmental agreements, which set them out. And they basically are internal and external. So these conferences of the parties, they um, look into um, reports submitted by states. They um, look at the role of uh, civil society and individuals. They uh, consolidate and analyze information from the governments. However, some of the multilateral environmental agreements make quite an open-ended statements relating to the functions of um, conferences of the parties. For instance, 1979 Convention on the Long Range Transboundary um, Air Pollution provides that COP can fulfill such other functions as may be appropriate under the provisions of the convention. So we have a very wide um, authorization for the a conference of the parties, which is no, and this authorization is very vague and unspecified. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change states that COP is to exercise such other functions that are required for the achievement of the objective of the convention. Again, a very open-ended uh, statement. Uh, probably the most famous and the most controversial was Article 17 of the Kyoto Protocol. The Conference of the Parties shall define the relevant principles, modalities, rules, and guidelines in particular for verification, reporting, and accountability for emissions trading. So as you can see, very many of these conventions gave a very free hand for these conferences of the parties to actually expand the convention, to fill the gaps, to um, probably even change the provisions of the convention, because as some of the authors, and I am in this number stated, that these decisions of COPs sometimes even um, amend and modify the text of the convention. So these um, powers of the convention and the character of the conven of um, decisions of the um, conferences of the parties is very unclear. And it was also a subject of certain analysis by um, professor now Judge Nolte during his work uh, in the International Law Commission on uh, subsequent um, practice of um, uh, states. So he came to the conclusion that these conferences of the parties are situated somewhere in between a diplomatic conference and an international organization. Again, quite a vague statement, which doesn't really 
um, pinpoint in a very precise way what are these conferences of the parties. So why these confer this decisions of conferences of the parties are so controversial? Because also on the basis of this very wide um, conceived powers, these conferences of the parties are uh, have the authority to establish non-compliance procedures, which decide on um, um, compliance of states with the provisions of these multilateral environmental agreements. And the uh, old um, non-compliance procedures, which are exemplified as the first of such procedures by Montreal Protocol, also included rather harsh means of suspension in uh, rights of the parties to the convention in cases of repeated non-compliance. So states basically, while expressing consent to be bound by uh, uh, multilateral environmental agreements, they um, didn't really know what they are consent, what they were consented to, giving um, the uh, in the view of uh, exponential powers of conferences of the parties. So we are now coming to uh, the law of treaties. So basically, we are talking about uh, consent to be bound, and consent to be bound is one of the most cherished and sacrosanct uh, privileges and rights of states while uh, they ratify, become a party to any treaty. So we have a very interesting um, phenomenon when states consent to a treaty and leave such a wide powers to conferences of the parties that some very important provisions of the treaty are left for the conferences of the parties and states are unaware at the moment of, exp of uh, expressing consent to be bound what actually these conferences of the parties are going to uh, decide. So, for example, all the basic, all the fundamental mechanisms of the Kyoto Protocol, like trading of emissions, were decided by a um, decision of the conference of the parties. And then we are having, of course, the problem, are these decisions binding or not? So another unresolved question, uh, because um, states follow them as they were binding, but in fact, they are only recommendations. However, as Professor Travers said in one of his writings, they are non-binding, but states treat them as binding. And this led Professor Brunet to call them de facto legislation. Again, quite a um, vague term. So we are now um, within the realm of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Article 11, Consent to be Bound, which uh, enumerates all the classical ways of expressing by a state consent to be bound, by signature, exchange of instruments constituting a treaty, ratification, acceptance, approval, or accession, or by other means, if so, agreed. So according to some of the scholars, and again, I am in this number, I think that the um, consent to be bound to decisions of COPs can fall in white brass strokes under the um, last uh, limb of the article 18, uh, 18 uh, 11, or by any other means, if so, agreed. But by these decisions, um, this, um, COPS also can modify um, the treaty. Therefore, 
it is somewhat in between Article 11 and 39 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And I would like to say that historically, um, these white functions of conferences of the parties actually developed from or evolved from the um, tacit acceptant, acceptance opting out procedure, which was um, precised by uh, mostly by the International Maritime Organization. This is the procedure which um, gives um, the organs of the IMO, in particular uh, the um, Committee on Environment, Marine Environmental Protection, possibility to modify the global agreements of uh, which are um, uh, which are concluded under the auspices of the IMO. Uh, to modify them on the basis of very um, flexible procedure, i.e. a tacit acceptance, which means the states are parties to the um, amendment unless they opt out. This procedure um, also raised the question of uh, legitimacy in relation to a position of a state. Because if certain number of states um, uh, do not express their opting out from the proposed um, amendment to the convention, then this amendment binds uh, all other states which didn't manage to opt out in a prescribed time. So this all started, in my view, uh, in giving this really quite a, um, a very wide powers to conferences of the parties, which of course enhance flexibility of multilateral environmental agreements, but also um, raise the question of legitimacy. Is it actually according to general international law and the Vienna Convention to put a state in a position of agreeing to uh, become a party to multilateral environmental agreement without fully having knowledge of what they are uh, to what they are agreeing? And this raised the question for states like Saudi Arabia, which all the time um, negated powers of COPS, MOPS, of Kyoto Protocol to actually um, create by its decision such important um, mechanisms as non-compliance procedures. Uh, states like Saudi Arabia were of the view that this should be only done through the proper amendment procedure based on the Vienna Convention. So the question of legitimacy was also raised by many scholars and theorists of international law. Um, I don't have time now to go in, de in depth through all the theories of legitimacy, but I would like to say that some of quite very important um, authors in international law and international environmental law said as follows, like Professor Bernstein, legality is potentially violated when a treaty body group of experts such as scientists empowered by a treaty or even a representative body of state delegates makes a decision that appears to go beyond the mandate given to them by the statute to which states consented. So this is a controversy 
great controversy surrounded surrounding multilateral environmental agreements. Uh, we can also view the legitimacy of decision of COPs through the, um, through the lens of the theory of legitimacy um, understood as fairness, which was elaborated by Professor Frank in his um, seminal seminal book and he obviously um, um, emphasized that the key factor or key factor of legitimacy is fairness which accommodates a popular belief that a system of rules to be fair must be firmly rooted in a framework of formal requirements about how the rules are made interpreted and applied. So he, um, he, according to Professor Frank, the attributes of leg legitimacy are symbolic validation, determinancy, adherence and coherence. So we could look at the decision making of COPS through the lens of theory of uh, Professor Frank which um, I and uh, Professor Mercuris try to develop in our book on treaties in motion. Uh, then if, uh, I would like to say that another attempt to uh, explain the legitimacy of decision-making by COPS was presented by Professor Brunet and Professor Tup which um, adapted the interactional theory of Lon Fuller into the ground of international environmental law. In this theory of Professor Fuller, legitimacy is based on cooperation and interaction between actors, the governing and the governed rooted within the social practice and conventions they created within the context of norms and institutions they establish. So the interactional perspective, it's not based on formal bindingness and thus abandons the division between soft and hard law, which I find it very interesting. The differentiation between legal norms and non-legal norms is affected through internal characteristics, which entail distinctive legal legitimacy and persuasiveness. And finally, they are um, views which are based on legit procedural safeguards to protect legitimacy. Um, which is which uh, are also expressed by certain authors like Zerin Savasan, who was uh, is of the view that um, in a preliminary phase of taking a decision, um, it should be prior consultation between the parties concerned, due process, transparency of proceedings. Um, however. Um, all these theories, in my view, don't really express quite uh, the legitimacy of decision making based on um, very wide provisions of multilateral environmental agreements. And in my view, one of still unresolved issues of general international law, theory of law, and law of treaties is how states actually agree to such white uh, functions of conferences of the parties and in a way abandon the um, basic rule of international law of consent to be bound and agreeing to be bound by certain um, future and uncertain decisions by organs of um, international conventions. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Fitzmorris, for raising very, um, very hard and very important conceptual, technical, and practical questions in your presentation. And now we move on to Professor Patricia Gavotella. Thank you so much. Uh, let me start by saying how uh, great pleasure it is to be today, uh, part of this uh, wonderful panel that um, you, um, uh, Dr. Like Emily Jones and um, Dr. Megan Wan have uh, chosen to close uh, this fantastic uh, series, uh, the Essex uh, Public International Law Lecture Series. Um, and also to congratulate uh, the both of you for taking advantage of the pandemics to put together uh, this uh, online series and, and keep the dialogue uh, going on. And uh, you're certainly an inspiration for uh, the young uh, generation of academics. And I'm uh, really um, grateful to be a part of uh, this and um, also with such esteemed colleagues and friends um, in the panel today. So when uh, we were discussing the topic of the panel, uh, modern challenges in international law, I was thinking, you know, what, what do I think it's one of the greatest um, challenges um, in international law? And from my um, experience, both as an academic and as a practitioner, uh, one of the greatest challenges that I think has to be highlighted, and that's the topic I chose to uh, speak about today, um, is uh, the challenges to international lawmaking. Um, that's uh, for me, um, as I was saying, both uh, from, from an academic perspective, but also from a perspective of somebody who uh, works um, as a legal advisor to a government, uh, but also in my capacity as member of the International Law Commission, I see that challenge as a very important one. Of course, I want to uh, make the disclaimer here that I'm speaking here in a purely personal capacity, and this is an academic uh, panel, and so um, uh, this is only personal views, but they are certainly influenced, of course, by my um, experience in uh, my roles as, as an academic and also as a practitioner. Um, and this um, issue of um, challenges to international lawmaking, when we think about uh, the world today as a globalized world, but also as a polarized world, they, I think they are particularly important and they lead me to make uh, three points and then come to a conclusion. I'll try to be um, as brief as possible so that also we can have uh, time to um, engage in a discussion among the panel and also with the participants. And uh, again, I congratulate you for uh, the excellent audience um, um, that is now following us and certainly we'll also uh, see this webcast uh, um, event. And so when I'm thinking of the modern challenges and, and particularly the change, challenges to international law making, I want to make three points. Um, the one first point is I think an obvious one uh, that international law has indeed uh, witnessed an incredible development, especially over the last 75 years. And that's the starting point. The second point would be about how we've come now um, to a moment where I would call it a moment of stagnation in terms of international uh, lawmaking. Um, and then the third point would be how do we overcome this moment of st stagnation and what are the um, uh, challenges um, in the future uh, regard to uh, international lawmaking. So let me develop a bit this uh, three points and then try to come to uh, concluding remarks um, so that then we can um, engage in the discussion. Um, the first point uh, that I said was the obvious one, and I think we can all um, uh, share it, but it's never too much uh, emphasizing it, is that uh, when we think about how international law was, especially before the creation of the United Nations and all the developments that came afterwards. Um, certainly we are now in, in a moment where the international legal framework, it's much more developed, much more developed in terms of the number of treaties, in, in terms of the number of customary international law rules um, at the bilateral level, at the multilateral level, and also as Judge Maria Teresa was pointing out, also at the regional level, which is, I think it's also an important uh, dimension of our discussion. So uh, certainly, and, and, and I see, say this um, 
when I speak to my students, because they normally, when you have uh, students that come from law and they come to international law, they tend to have an, a skeptical look at international law and the international lawmaking process because the law, international lawmaking process is much more organic and uh, diffused compared with the national um, lawmaking process. And I think it's always worth e emphasizing that we are now at the point where we have much more robust, much more um, detailed, um, also in areas of general international law, but also in several areas of uh, specialized fields of international law. And uh, today we have already heard a lot about um, environmental law, law of the sea. We will hear, I'm sure, about human rights. Um, and so um, it's uh, uh, incomparable to what we had uh, before the, um, uh, the creation of the United Nations, of course, in the beginning of the century with the League of Nations, there was already a big step towards um, multilateral processes that led to more international law. Uh, but certainly now uh, we've had a number of foundational, uh, starting with the Charter, but also all the treaties that were adopted, uh, both in terms of general international law, a lot by the work also of the International Law Commission that played um, a fundamental role in developing um, the law of um, treaties, the law of uh, diplomatic relations, also um, in the beginning, the law of the sea, um, and the law of state responsibility that we'll also hear about today. And uh, also, uh, we've had, um, and this is a point that I think it's also worth uh, reminding, um, uh, reminding us that um, although we saw this boom in treaty making, uh, we um, continue to uh, have customary international law as a source of great relevance in international law, especially because this dynamic um, uh, approach um, that treaties and, and, and custom interact, and they also, by that interaction, uh, they advance international law. And also, if we think about the other sources like general principles, but also uh, doctrine and case law as subsidiary means we've seen an exponential growth uh, in terms of their production, their existence, their affirmation. And so certainly we uh, witnessed in the last 70 years a great growth in terms of international law and a great development in the processes of international lawmaking. Um, at the moment, and I think that that's probably true um, uh, in the last few years, it's difficult to put an exact date. Uh, certainly the last five years have been particularly difficult um, in terms of when we look at the statistics in terms of international lawmaking, and especially I'm, I'm talking now, I'm focusing more at the multilateral level, because of course, at the national level um, um, and bilateral level, the treaty making uh, continues, I think, very intensively. States have more and more economic, commercial uh, investment relations. And so we, we witness a great number um, of um, uh, treaty making, uh, bilateral treaty making among states. Uh, so I'm talking more now, of course, at the more macro level, at the multinational level, multilateral level, um, and in particular at the UN. So in the past, um, I would think that first we had a period, um, and it's very interesting to think that even when we had, when one thinks of a polarized world, we also, that we speak about today, we also think about the world of the Cold War. And it, it's very interesting to note that during that period, although the world was very polarized during the Cold War, probably the most polarized that it's been so far, it was a period of um, big production, intense production of international law, where great treaties uh, were adopted in the field of human rights and uh, general international law, as I was just uh, mentioning. But uh, in the last uh, 20 years, um, after the enthusiasm, after the fall of the Berlin War and the regaining of uh, relevance of uh, uh, the UN, um, we've seen a diminishing, uh, diminishing um, interest, um, uh, which has been accentuated certainly over the last uh, uh, five to 10 years. If we look, for example, um, at the work that the International Law Commission uh, has been carrying out, um, certainly there's a big mark um, in uh, the um, uh, Adoption of the Articles on State Responsibility exactly 20 years ago, uh, 
um, uh, this year um, and uh, that uh, those articles were not and have not yet been transformed into a convention. So that is certainly a turning point and we've seen after that uh, that uh, um, uh, there's been no, uh, with the exception of the Convention on uh, immunity, Jurisdictional Immunities of States and Their Property in 2004, uh, there hasn't been a treaty adopted on the basis of a draft of the International Law Commission uh, since then and probably um, uh, the articles on state responsibility mark an important, an important step um, on that. And if we look, for example, in the more recent years, uh, the draft articles on protection of uh, persons in the event of disasters have not yet been uh, transformed and they're, I think, far from it still uh, into a convention and more recently the draft articles on crimes against humanity that were finalized by the commission and they are still uh, being discussed and there's been this practice of technical ro rollovers every three years uh, in the six committees. So certainly uh, from the point of view of the International Law Commission, we've witnessed um, uh, certain stagnation um, in terms of states taking up uh, drafts of the ILC to make in, making them into treaties, uh, but also in other areas. I think in, if we look at the last five years, perhaps uh, with the exception of the treaty that uh, uh, Judge Maria Teresa mentioned, the, the Escazú Treaty in 2018, there haven't been very much relevant treaties, and especially since the Paris Agreement, which I think was the last bigger agreement in 2015 in a very spe special uh, moment that the international community came together uh, to adopt this very important treaty. So what we're witnessing in this moment of stagnation, which I don't think it's a moment of regression, I tend not to have that more negative view, although we saw some states withdrawing from treaties, but also some states coming back. So I wouldn't call it a regression, but I would call it a stagnation uh, moment. Uh, we've seen uh, that um, there's less appetite for major international agreements, with the exception of the Escazú Agreement and the Paris Agreement. Uh, the only big process that is going now in terms of multilateral negotiations at the UN was also mentioned by Judge Maria Teresa um, on uh, the BBNJ, the, um, uh, the question of the protection of the biodiversity uh, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, there was an important attempt, but a failed attempt in some way, although not yet completely over, but uh, in, in a moment of pause at the moment, which was the attempt to draft the Global Pact for the Environment. Uh, that was something also that uh, um, uh, we saw that uh, in the process of in 2018-19, in the negotiations that were carried out in the framework of uh, the UN, uh, there wasn't consensus to move forward. Uh, towards the global pact for the environment. And I mean, I could give other um, examples, but what we've seen in the last uh, five, 10 years is on the one hand, I think international adjudication has been busier than ever. Uh, if we look at the case uh, load before the ICJ, before it laws, um, international arbitration, there's been really an increase um, and, and that's a factor also uh, worth mentioning. So it's not that states are not trusting international institutions because they do also with their disputes. Uh, it's just that there's a less appetite for um, a binding commitments also because we've seen, and maybe that's an alternative and that's something that I would come back in a moment. Um, uh, there's been, I think, a renewed interest in soft law. Um, uh, we've had the global compacts on refugees and migrants uh, we've had the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Uh, we've had recently also the um, working group, the open-ended working group uh, on cyber uh, coming to a consensus report um, uh, recently uh, this year. So um, I think we have to acknowledge that there is a certain uh, stagnation and the, at the same time, a certain interest in adjudication, necessity, interest, openness in adjudication, and also a renewed interest uh, with regard to soft law um, as an alternative, uh, uh, probably in or a possible uh, way out uh, in this moment. So the point is, what do we do? I mean, what do we do, uh, especially when we think that um, there are major challenges, current challenges that probably needs um, uh, binding commitments from uh, states uh, so that we can ensure uh, 
uh, that the international community is prepared uh, to deal with uh, the um, uh, most serious uh, challenges that it's facing and um, aspects related to climate change, for example. I would also say uh, pandemics. I think there's a question that needs to be discussed um, and it is being discussed. Uh, there's a proposal for a new pandem pandemics treaty, um, recognizing that the international health regulations are probably not enough uh, to deal uh, with pandemics uh, at the scale as we've seen uh, the current one. Um, and um, also other new challenges like uh, um, uh, digital new technologies, cyber. Um, so we have um, certainly um, important challenges to be addressed um, uh, where international law um, is not yet fully developed, needs further development, uh, needs further uh, detail um, at the multilateral uh, level. And so the question is whether, and, and especially thinking of uh, some of these challenges um, thinking how normally the international community reacts and how international law is made and, and, and developed um, normally through um, an approach that is um, reactive, that is crisis driven. Um, and, and this is what we've had certainly uh, since uh, um, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the instruments that were put into place after the First World War, after the Second World War, international law has been mostly uh, reactive and crisis driven. And, and now uh, I think uh, we really should think whether, um, uh, and especially when we focus about these uh, new challenges um, that are already looming, but will be greater and greater if international law shouldn't be more uh, proactive and, and put together the um, uh, instruments and the legal framework in place before uh, the crisis becomes even, in, even worse. So uh, you can do that, of course, uh, through uh, the traditional sources of international law, that's clear. Uh, and I think that um, what was been um, highlighted also by Professor Fitzmaurice in the, in the sense that uh, uh, there is uh, room probably for, even though keeping um, a traditional approach to the sources, uh, to think about a more dynamic approach to the sources, a more inter, uh, interactional uh, approach to the sources, uh, by which we can see, you know, treaty law, uh, we can see um, customary international law interacting more. Uh, we'll see also, I think it's going to be, it's an interesting topic that is now on the agenda of the International Law Commission, which is the topic of general principles. It's a bit the forgotten source of international law, but we're working on the topic now. It's still at the initial stages, but uh, um, it's not um, an exercise of identification of general principles, but an exercise of, um, of, of a list, uh, in the sense of a list, but in, in terms of the process of identification of general principles of law that uh, are common to the domestic systems, but the rapporteur, the general, uh, the special rapporteur is also taking the view that the general principles of law can also be general principles formed within the international legal system, so that will be also interesting, and that's uh, something that would be of particular relevance, for example, for international environmental law or for international humanitarian law. So that will be, I think, an interesting development, and we'll see how um, that project will uh, turn out. We still have a few years to go, and uh, and states certainly then will have to um, also give uh, us our, their views on this, especially on the possibility of having general principles formed within the international legal system. So I think we have to still work on the traditional sources, uh, but at, at the same time, um, a, a more um, interactive, dynamic approach to the sources. And also, uh, as, as um, I was mentioning before, uh, this idea of soft law um, as an alternative or as something that would get, have a role in this intermediate uh, period uh, where the political atmosphere um, is probably not conducive uh, to new international treaties. I, I like to uh, use here the words that were um, uh, used by Professor Ann Peters um, in um, an article she wrote in the European, uh, um, uh, in, in, in the Agile talk about the global compact on migration, that soft law can be pre-law, para-law, or law plus. I think that's an interesting approach. We probably will see also more um, um, the type of uh, international lawmaking 
uh, like in the Paris Agreement, where you have a mix um, of binding and also non-binding commitments. I think that's also an interesting approach. Um, and uh, we will probably have more uh, situations where work of the International Law Commission is not adopted as a convention, but by um, authority, the, um, uh, the term I think was already used in a different context uh, um, by, by Professor Fitzmaurice of a non-legislative um, um, codification. This was a term that was used also in the context of the Articles of State, State Responsibility, uh, or as the late David Karen said, the paradox between form and authority. So I think we'll see uh, more of that and, and soft law as being um, um, not as a diluter um, of normativity, but in an interaction with the formal sources of international law, not weakening it, but uh, reinforcing it. So I think we, as a, in a collective, the Invisible College of International Lawyers, I think we have to think about the future of uh, international law and especially how it's made and um, having into account uh, uh, the political context that we are in. So I would stop my remarks here and I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor um, Patricia Gabaltelis, for that very um, enlightening and rich presentation and for the kind words to Dr. Jones and I. Um, if we could open the floor now for Professor Patsadzis to start your presentation. Thank you very much. And um, it's a great pleasure to be with you. I, I do want to thank, uh, join my thanks both to Emily Jones and you, Megan Wong, for this kind invitation. And I must say, um, I feel um, wonderful to be, it's wonderful to be among friends. And I also uh, note that you have um, uh, sort of a all women panel. So it's, uh, we feel quite uh, empowered as we're going through this afternoon. I, um, I'm starting to get, you know, my, uh, my confidence is rising. So thanks for the invitation. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, I was at, when I was asked to address some modern challenges in international law, uh, you know, international law is always has many challenges. So, and it's, it's in a constant state of movement. Um, I thought I would return uh, to a classical issue um, I, we've also heard about lawmaking. We've heard about the relation between the regional and the universal. We've heard uh, we've heard um, the various forms and, and instruments uh, which uh, states might use for their relations between them. So I thought I would um, also address and come back to some questions on the perennial, of course, and the huge topic of state responsibility. So, and coming in the end, perhaps it's sort of also a tie, some of my comments will tie in with some of those uh, made previously by my colleagues. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, now it's 20 years, I think, since the adoption of the articles and we on responsibility, uh, Patricia mentioned uh, whether, what kind of process this was a non-legislative codification can be viewed in many ways, but the fact remains that it was um, a very, a very interesting, maybe even defining moment in international law. Not because something new, or well, there was a part of something new that came out of this, but it was a first attempt, really, to to put down uh, in paper, as you wish, the the. Um, you know, the consequences for states when they um, violate uh, their uh, international obligations. So that's why I, I imagine it's one of the reasons why this is a recurring topic. And I just wanted to make a few comments today, this afternoon, on um, some maybe changes or perhaps uh, some uh, future challenges in this area. Now, First of all, of course, there, there was a lot of practice before, during, and after the adoption of the articles. And that's why I think I, I was referring before there was a continuum. Uh, there was um, a lot of arbitral practice at the beginnings of the 18th, 19th century, uh, 
um, which continued in the early 20th century. And there was a lot, of course, of discussion and difficulty on how to address such issues. And I think we see that recurring today because I think the issue of whether this uh, codification, um, which is not a real codification, but a codification nonetheless, should actually take the form uh, of a treaty. And I have the impression that most of us probably have already answered this question uh, in between, uh, I mean, in our, with ourselves by saying, and why have an international treaty when you have all this application of the rules of state responsibility by judges, uh, quasi-judicial bodies, sometimes even uh, reference to them in domestic courts. So, I mean, it, they're a reality. And it's, it's natural that, in, because of the, the most of the content of um, the law of state responsibility, if you wish, it's natural that international courts and tribunals are those who are the frequent users in the sense that they usually will be asked at one point or another uh, uh, on, an, on issues of state responsibility. So in a sense, the, the earlier jurisprudence has been, of course, uh, complemented by a very, um, uh, a very important uh, case law, as Patricia was saying, from many international courts and tribunals, regional, um, uh, interstate, um, specific in, in special areas like human rights and so forth. And there it has been, uh, these, these ideas or these principles have been further fleshed out, I would say. And I would say that in some, in, in a sense, sometimes uh, some courts have even um, moved to progressively develop some um, articles which already formed part of customary international law in the post uh, adoption, 2001 adoption. So th this has been interesting. I mean, we see a fleshing out of the, the, the ideas, the law of state responsibility through the work uh, and the jurisprudence of uh, international courts and, and tribunals. And that we have a new process, I think, but Patricia, maybe we might be able to discuss it, where perhaps uh, courts and tribunals are going even more forward in, uh, in developing um, the customary status of um, the law of state responsibility. So this, you know, this is a multiple, this, I mean, this, uh, there's a, a relationship between, I mean, codification between um, um, state practice and um, case law, international, especially international case law, uh, that has been very instrumental in uh, shaping uh, the rules of international responsibility of state. And here, of course, I won't go through all the rules. I'm just saying some of them, you know, and we know were reflected in existing custom and there was not much, um, um, I mean, discussion uh, or a conflict in adopting some of the articles, as you know, um, and then, you know, judicial decisions came and, and fleshed things more, uh, more clearly. I mean, the issues of attribution, let me say for an example, um, um, uh, and others, you know, were more, um, how can I say, uh, more, <clears throat> uh, more easy to um, approach and for states, for example, to feel comfortable when coming uh, in front of um, internet uh, courts uh, decisions. Now, <clears throat> what a, a second point which was which is interesting in this whole lawmaking process because I think, you know, part of the interest of the law state responsibility is the lawmaking process itself, and then the other part is the application of this by courts uh, and tribunals or other, of course, actors. <clears throat> 
that um, in what we knew at that time and what the commission was very uh, um, aware of at that time, that certain um, um, provisions were in fact progressive development of international law. There, uh, one can witness what uh, this was called the twilight uh, normative twilight zone, I think, of normativity by the International Law Commission at that point. At that point, but we can we can observe that international jurisprudence has helped, if you wish, uh, pave the way or help in this. Um, in making um, some of the provisions which were progressive development, streamlining them within uh, what states would be, uh, or say, willing to, to uh, accept. And of course, and this is um, my third point, and then I will just move to some observations, is that it, it does depend on practice. So the practice regarding some articles has been more more usual. Uh, the practice of other articles or provisions has been more scant, uh, some even non-existent. But overall, um, what happens in, in my opinion in, in, in the jurisprudence of international courts and tribunals was to, to have pulled or even now perhaps currently being in the process of doing so, of pulling some of the articles out of the realm of progressive development and into, um, into the area perhaps of uh, established, and I won't say customary, but uh, a law. Now, apart from this you know, uh, effect uh, on, uh, of judicial practice to the normative uh, caliber of uh, provisions, there's another kind of interaction that um, would reveal the wider impact and perhaps also the challenges that we possibly might you know, face uh, in the future. Um, and um, I want to give just a few examples, potential avenues where you know, we might be, uh, we might want to discuss or things are, or, or this, where these issues are being discussed. First of all, of course, the more prominent example is that we have a, a wider application of the general rules and principles of state responsibility as default rules in specific regimes. And this will come bring me, of course, to uh, something I will uh, return to at the end of, of this um, presentation. Um, in the context of uh, human rights adjudication, but uh, not only, Patricia, uh, in investment, uh, as investor state arbitration, for example, to give uh, just an example of areas where principles governing state responsibility, I mean, responsibility of states were used by, are used by analogy, if you wish, in relations uh, involving a state and a non-state entity, be that a corporation or an individual uh, and so forth. And we see investment tribunals quasi consistently applying rules of state responsibility in investor state arbitration, sometimes without even you know, asking themselves. It, it, it sort of comes as a matter of fact, even though of course uh, they, they might um, uh, you know, uh, have received the reaction either from of course the claimant or uh, the person or the, the uh, investor. So uh, I mean, rules of attribution, circumstances precluding wrongfulness, uh, et cetera. So the, the set of interstate rules has been transferred um, in, in, in a form of a common law. I, wouldn't, I, I don't know if it would be principles, uh, Patricia, I'll leave it to the International Law Commission to see that in the future, but a sort of a common law which is applicable um, to, you know, even outside interstate relations. And this, of course, has been, again, the, the agent that has been moving this forward is this cross-fertilization we, we, we are seeing between various courts and tribunals where, um, where courts look into each other, even though, you know, they might come from a different set and a different institutional background. I mean, 
you see human rights uh, mechanisms or courts looking into interstate uh, um, jurisprudence and the other way around and then arbitrators and investment arbitrators looking uh, in various ways. So this, this idea of cross-fertilization probably has helped flesh out some of the issues, one of which, and that I, I was, I've worked on it, so I won't refer to it um, um, extensively, is the issue of the consequences in terms of, of reparation, Article 31 and, um, uh, and um, subsequent of the uh, Articles of State Responsibility, where we have a, now an increasingly rich jurisprudence, uh, even though, of course, the precursor, uh, as the French would say, was the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which you know, long before the draft articles were uh, adopted, had you know a very uh, ex expansive view of the idea of repairing uh, violations. Of course, uh, in its case, human rights violations. So that could be something different. But I mean, even the International Court of Justice, when it did come finally to have to address the issue of reparation, had to look to other courts, and it was very interesting to see uh, the court in The Hague turn and look to other courts when it had its first issue of compensation in the Diallo case. It sort of had to, oops, okay, let's go see what's happening. Uh, so this is maybe one issue where we see this um, cross-fertilization, perhaps a, a post-2001 uh, uh, development uh, in, um, especially through ju jurisprudential practice. A second um, example relates to the idea of um, breaches of specific, I mean, obligations that are owed to the international community as a whole, or which protect collective interests of a group of states. And I think here, um, uh, Judge Jacafi, I think, and Professor Fitzmaurice maybe referred uh, to some of these issues where, you know, we didn't know how the articles, um, especially articles 48, et cetera, were going to be applied, if they were going to be applied. And this was um, a progressive development. And we saw that the International Court of Justice from uh, the, um, uh, a case relating to the uh, obligation to prosecute or extradite where we had a, the convention against torture that was the applicable convention. And there you had, you know, uh, various state parties to this convention. Uh, and we saw this idea of, you know, a state party to a multilateral convention where, you know, there's a lot of other states involved comes to invoke uh, a, a breach of this uh, and uh, we see, you know, the first uh, ideas of this uh, collective, if you wish, I mean, response rather to um, an obligation, um, which is of a collective character, but conventional, of course. And the most recent example of this is the Gambia versus Myanmar case, where, I mean, the, the idea of having at least the, the semantics of having a state from Africa turning against a state in Asia for the violation of a very fundamental convention, which is the Convention on Genocide, was a very interesting, I think, aspect which brought this idea of erga omnis partis into view. And you, see, I mean, if you turn to other um, courts, I will not turn to them now due to lack of time. But if you turn, for example, to the International Criminal Court, you see the recent decisions where the idea of, you know, transgenerational transmission of trauma from ascendance to descendants. I mean, we are having, we are witnessing, you know, an opening of these issues, I think, of responsibility uh, to uh, many new avenues, which I'm sure will be explored in the future. And finally, let me say a few words on what uh, I've called before the, the greening of international responsibility, most notably in the increase of cases brought before uh, international judicial and non-judicial or quasi-judicial bodies, 
relating to state responsibility for environmental harm or damage. Uh, the, the, the interesting th here, thing here that I want to um, note is that, of course, the ILC has looked at the uh, idea of transboundary harm uh, through a different um, uh, through a different prism, uh, and we see now courts, or rather states, or rather I should say, even more importantly, perhaps individuals, turning to courts for issues of environment and and climate change. Now, this is something which uh, indeed uh, we do have uh, advisory opinions of the international, again, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. We do have the Portuguese children case before the uh, European Court of Human Rights and we're waiting to see what you know, this will bring. Uh, we have uh, issues and here you will allow me to refer to cases that, came, uh, that have come before the um, Human Rights Committee uh, on uh, um, on environment and climate change, Tacey OSHA versus New Zealand, which was basically a deportation case, but you know it had to do with uh, the environment, linking uh, you know deportation to the environment, and the uh, Paraguayan case, uh, the Caceres case, where there you had the issue of what you know, uh, I mean the the harm that is done uh, by a state. Uh, because it has not exercised due diligence, can in fact, you know, uh, lead to a violation of the state's part, uh, the state's obligations uh, in the field, in the field of human rights. And this is now this is a further thing that will need to be sort of dis detangled. And maybe Malgosha would like to come in on this, on how to, if we will be able to detangle environment from human rights. I was talking about greening or maturing of environmental law, but as Malgosia and the other speakers were speaking, I was thinking, but you know, we're actually dealing uh, uh, um, with environmental law through human rights. I mean, it's, it's so we need to see what this will bring, but, and to come to the end of my, and just the remarks, on what impact this will have, we, one can imagine that this will have impact not only on issues of jurisdiction or territoriality and extraterritoriality and all these issues, but also on questions that have to do with due diligence, with repairing, with causality, causation, I mean, how, and then with quantifying damages. And I think that, um, uh, and that we, we see this because all of a sudden there's this interest or there's this avenue, this jurisdictional avenue that is being pursued through human rights. And I can refer to a case which has been, uh, it hasn't been decided yet by the Human Rights Committee, but there's also already a lot of publicity around it, uh, not from the committee itself on uh, the, the Torres Strait, um, the Islanders and the, this um, complaint they have submitted against um, Australia alleging uh, failure of the state to address uh, climate change. So, I mean, I think that these, you know, the, this, these new avenues perhaps will lead to also courts or uh, mechanisms or states or other actors, if you wish, uh, returning to see how they will impact, I mean, these new developments will impact the law of state responsibility, which is really a law in movement. Uh, it has, I mean, it was codified, uh, of course, in 2001, but it was a law in movement before and after. Finally, if you allow me, Emily and um, uh, Megan, I don't know if I've really exceeded my time. Um, as I was preparing this um, lecture, I, I was rereading an article uh, in the American Journal of International Law uh, in a very recent uh, 2020 article by um, Martin um, Paparinskis as to whether the global pandemic might affect the future of state responsibility. And when I first looked at it, I thought, oh, well, okay, uh, let me see. But um, there is an argument there that is very interesting perhaps to pursue, and it has to do with what I was calling the, you know, communitarism, the bilateralism, and then these 
erga omnes uh, partis uh, obligations, but uh, there might be this um, this issue that I think we probably see coming back, uh, where uh, and then Martin's ask whether states aren't ret retreat retreating but retreating back into their bilateralistic point of view uh, rather than. Uh, Opening uh, towards a, a communitary, a communitary um, uh, interest. I don't have the response yet. Uh, I would like to end on a more, um, I mean, a more positive, say, and uh, uh, optimistic, if you wish, um, uh, note and maybe leave some room for the discussion as to whether we can really be positive uh, in the future in regarding all these issues. I remain open to a discussion and I do thank all colleagues for, I mean, giving me more food for thought as I was listening to you all uh, to, um, for this uh, presentation. Thank you, Megan and Emily. Thank you, Professor Patsartsis for that intervention and for pointing us to truly excellent um, scholarship and nuances of the very fascinating state responsibility. Um, so I'm very aware that um, in the interest of time, so perhaps if I could just open the panel to um, our impressive panelists to comment very briefly, if I could, um, you know, if I could ask if you make it very brief on each other's presentations and also whilst we are on the theme of extraordinary women as Professor Pazartzis had pointed out we also have a question in the audience from Judge Kafi's colleague Judge Lisbeth Leinzad who has also a question for our um, our esteemed panel so if I could ask you to if I open the floor perhaps to Patricia Gavaltelis to start the discussion and then if we just have a brief intervention and then we can conclude the event with um, a few questions and starting with Judge uh, Leinzad's um, question. So if we could just start that way. Thank you, Megan. Sure. I think we're going to need another panel <laughs> to continue to discuss this because this has been, I think, a really fascinating complementary, some nuances, different views, but I think we have some main common uh, topics and, and, and perhaps I think if you allow me again, I would also add in the mix um, uh, Judge Elizabeth Linzat's question <laughs> that is in the chat, because I think it touches on the point that I wanted to um, uh, raise from, um, from all the comments. And, and of course, Judge Lisbeth could have been one of uh, the panelists today also, because she is also an exceptional uh, woman. Uh, so I, no, I think that um, really one point that we have to um, continue to uh, discuss and reflect on um, is um, the issue of um, the political will of states. Um, that's, I think, that's a key issue, and it's something that it's uh, hinted at, that uh, uh, the question by Judge Linzat, um, uh, I think we have an issue now. It's uh, um, states, um, for different reasons, I don't think they all have the same reasons, but for di different reasons, there's an hesitation. There's a, a lack of political will for new binding commitments. Um, the other point that I wanted to make, and that I think it came out also in the, uh, the different discussions, is that there's really also an issue uh, between how do we progress? How do we make progress? Do we always need strict consensus? Of course, that's desirable. I think this is a point that, for example, Professor, Professor Fitzmaurice's um, 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 presentation really evidenced the, the question between uh, um, flexibility versus legitimacy. I mean, the question of consensus and in the Sixth Committee, for example, in the legal issues, this has been something that it's um, very strong. But, but what, are, what are there limits to consensus or should there be limits to consensus? And do we need sometimes to move uh, with something short of consensus um, to advance uh, international law? And then the other point that I wanted to make, which I think it's also a bit common uh, and it's highlighted especially now with um, uh, Professor Pazartz's um, uh, presentation on the question of state responsibility um, and also in uh, the answer to the question in the chat is, um, uh, states at the same time don't seem 
so conscious of the need to have ownership of the process. So when we let developments by the ILC or by soft law in the sense that uh, states are not in full control, um, they lack that ownership and then there's a problem, maybe there's a problem of legitimacy also, there's a problem of compliance, there's a problem of um, you know, whether, for example, nas national jurisdictions, which I think are very important, the domestic jurisdiction is a very important extension of uh, the implementation tools of international law. So um, I think um, we need to continue to reflect around this three points of political will, consensus and ownership um, on how to continue uh, making international law develop um, uh, to address the key issues that I think we've all highlighted from human rights, environmental law, climate change, uh, um, uh, investment arbitration, et cetera. So I would limit my comments here because I'm also conscious of the time, but it's been a fascinating panel. Thank you. Um, Professor Fitzmaurice, if you would like to go next. Yeah. Um, can I add something to this? Yeah. Um, well, I would like to sort of make a few comments, which I think um, touch upon presentations of the panelists. First of all, um, I was very interested in the stagnation aspect of international law. I must say that uh, I never look at it from this point of view, so it was like an eye opener. But I think that there are some uh, green shoots of hope in the stagnation. If you look at particular and very modest practice of stay, maybe not modest, but not well known, concerning, for instance, the protection of marine environment. And when you, I am sort of, I think I, well, I am interested in, I do research in Marpol Convention, for instance, and other and protection of marine environment in general. And, and I can see that more and more annexes to MARPOL are actually ratified by states. And this is with great actually um, expense. It's, it's like annex six on basically climate change, on, on gases, on uh, gases uh, from shipping. And more and more states, even developing states, are ratifying this um, annex, which uh, requires quite a lot of, uh, um, well, it's very, it's very costly, very expensive. It's not an easy thing to uh, become a party to annexes, which really require changes in shipping. I don't think that many people realize that it's not just ratification, you have to put in place domestic legislation and implement it in order to ratify an annex. And I think more and more states are becoming parties to chemical annexes, to most importantly, Annex 6. So I think that there is something uh, happening in a, in a way which maybe it's not very flamboyant and well known, but maybe it's a little bit sort of getting out of stagnation through little steps, I would say. And uh, for instance, plastic pollution, IMO is now uh, making a huge initiative on plastic pollution, which uh, brought all the states, which I also think that it's sort of maybe a way a bit out of stagnation in international law. Now, I would like to make a comment also on interesting points on soft law, that again, from the practice of the IMO, where are all these codes of practice which were not incorporated in conventions, states, although they are soft law, states tend to follow them, which is uh, quite interesting. And another phenomenon which uh, arose, I think, from the uh, Paris, specifically Paris Agreement, is inclusion of soft law provision into a binding treaty. And I s kind of spent quite a lot of time thinking about it, whether the obligation of states uh, in relation to soft law provisions in a treaty 
are the same as obligations in relation to hard law provision in a treaty. And if they are different, what is, and this is probably um, a question directed to Faye, what would be the state responsibility of states breaching soft law provisions in a hard, uh, hard law treaty? This is a question which, uh, in my view, is not fully researched. I know that they are views like Professor Bodański, the treaty is a treaty, but is it, does it follow really what states think? I am not sure. Uh, there is no practice, but I think it's a question, good question of international law. What would be the response of uh, state responsibility? And then um, my um, uh, also comment on regionalism that I think, and which also relates to human rights and environment. I think that American Regional Human Rights Court uh, made the most important contribution to bringing environment and human rights together by the uh, advisory opinion of Inter-American Court on, on human rights, I think. It drew human right to clean environment by interpreting provision of the convention, which doesn't have such a right. It puts together all the basic principles underlying environmental law. And I also would like to mention in this respect, of course, a comment, general comment, I think number 36, I think, of the Human Rights Committee. I think this is, in my view, the most exciting development now in putting together environment and uh, as a human right. I think that uh, what was piecemeal approach of the European Court of Human Rights, it's becoming a sort of more general practice and regional practice, in my view, in a great, to great extent, it's affecting now universal practice. So. I think these are my comments. Thank you very much. Um, who would like to go next? Um, Judge Coffey, would you like? To Thank you very much. I think the four presentations or the three other presentations gave me the opportunity to reflect and to uh, see and to recapitulate on some of the issues that have been going through uh, my own presentation and the preparation of, of, the, of the, the presentation. And one thing, one thing that strikes me a lot is the question of, uh, that was raised by, by Gostian, followed by Patricia and by uh, Fotini, in the sense that we have an international law that is being established, invoked, argued, uh, and uh, uh, discussed before international courts, domestic courts and so on. But then we have this uh, process through which we translate international law domestically. It is not the question of the hierarchy, not even the question of, of uh, uh, changing the nature of law and so on. It is how uh, the, the problem that states face uh, uh, when they would like to uh, implement international law as legislated internationally uh, by conferences, by uh, international bodies, uh, resolutions and, or measures adopted internationally. That's a big issue. And I think maybe one of the reasons of this stagnation in not moving into the adoption of conventions, it is because some states fear or are aware of the consequences of having hard law and not being able to implement this hard law uh, requests on responsibilities uh, uh, in, in, uh, domestically. It is very, very difficult. My Gosha mentioned the IMO uh, uh, new uh, agreements regarding MARPOL or in the MARPOL framework and in many other frameworks in which we have, this is the Eskasu problem, maybe, in, in many areas in which uh, the uh, uh, level of engagement uh, 
that states will have to uh, adopt or to make is very hard. It is not only a financial uh, uh, component, it is also a political component, lack of domestic consensus and so on. So international law is becoming very demanding, more demanding. It's not only a question of abiding by interna general international law, it's also a technical problem. And uh, this capacity building process is uh, 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 very striking in Latin America. Uh, sometimes we adopt pieces of legislation, but we don't know how to implement certain uh, norms and so on. And especially when we go to uh, uh, measures or resolutions or decisions adopted by conference, international conferences, we have to look not only at the constitutional framework of those uh, resolutions, but also uh, the, the implications in terms of commitment, engagement, and measures. And I think that is a big challenge. I like this subject very much. I will uh, I'm continuously or permanently looking at the consequences for uh, our countries or in our countries. I'm thinking, for example, of the law to cooperate with International Criminal Court, which is a, a domestic uh, a piece of legislation, but that uh, may have different meaning in different or for different states. And that is something which is very, very of high importance for jurists and, and advisory bodies and so on. So it is less, to me, it is less a question of legitimacy. It's more a question of, of effectiveness uh, at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Kafi. Um, Professor Pizzarti. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted I wanted to come back on a few um, well comments that I had as I was uh, listening to all our speakers. And uh, first of all, I want to say that I was interested in this this regional universal that um, uh, Judge Kaffe uh, presented to us in the beginning. And I was interested to hear her opinion that it was more doctrinal a doctrinal debate ra rather than you know a, a real practical one. Um, my, but what what I was wondering as I was listening to to a professor uh, to Judge Caffey is about empowering domestic institutions and maybe domestic judicial institutions, um, at least in in the field of of of, of human rights law. Um, what would be the role of the Inter American Court in re in relation to domestic institutions? I have the impression from reading and from uh, uh, discussing with uh, Latin American scholars that they feel some of the some some of the Latin American states, if not all, I'm not sure, feel or look to the Inter-American Court as sort of a constitutional court in in the Latin American system. So I was wondering whether um, that holds any uh, truth to it. Um, I also wanted to maybe tie in Malgozia's question on why would states give, you know, power to conference of parties, to the state parties, you know, to make decisions. Uh, and then I would tie it with, with what um, Patricia was saying, because maybe, you know, these are the, the new forms of, of lawmaking or interstitial lawmaking in, in a sense that, um, um, you know, we go we go away from maybe a treaty and into um, um, other forms of you know within the life of a treaty of uh, of obtaining um, you know obtaining new law or something like that. And I was you know I was trying to see whether this can be tied with this idea of. The problems of lawmaking and maybe the stagnation, and now, now the law may. And here I would probably add one more one one act one uh, element. When we talk about lawmaking and ask why you know why we have this stagnation or whether this is a stagnation, I think that we need to also keep into consideration in the picture, if you wish, uh, the actors in this process. So maybe there is also a change of the actors in this process, you know. So maybe I mean, conference of parties are now new actors in a process 
that uh, work alongside states or in lieu of states, I don't know, as we have other actors who are more, more and more um, involved in the lawmaking process. It's not only states anymore. So perhaps we need you know, to, a change, a shift in the way we think of lawmaking as being you know, just coming from either a, a very uh, uh, honorable institution like the International Law Commission, but also as coming from states only. I mean, it comes from uh, also other actors that we have to keep into consideration. And as to responsibility for soft law, I don't know Malgosia. Uh, I'm wondering whether the, the, this, this idea of using human rights law, which is uh, in a sense, um, maybe a little more harder than uh, law of the environment is a way of you know, finding access, if you wish, to, 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 um, to, juris to jurisdiction, to international jurisdiction. So I mean, it, it's um, uh, otherwise, you know, soft law when it's in an instrument, you know, we have to take uh, into consideration the instrument as well. It, it, it would be difficult, for example, to maybe establish responsibility for violation of a good faith or due diligence obligation. So that, but I think that the way st uh, individuals rather are looking into human rights as, a, as an avenue to pursue environmental litigation uh, is uh, perhaps shows that maybe uh, environmental law is not that, um, well, is not equipped with the mechanisms permitting uh, recourse to um, dispute sub uh, judicial settlement procedures. Thank you, Emily. This is, these were my comments to everyone and my answers. Thank you. Thank you very much to our very impressive and um, illustrious panelists. In the interest of time, regrettably, I don't think that we'll have um, time to open for Q&A in the interest of time as I would not wish to monopolize everyone's time even further. But we have, of course, so many questions, greetings from, um, you know, greetings from Brazil um, and all sorts of other questions. But perhaps we can just end the note on this very rich discussion between the panelists and if Dr. Jones, if you, Dr. Jones, if you would like to um, say a few closing words. Yeah, just to thank you to join Dr. Wong and thanking you for that fascinating panel. You gave us so much to think about. Um, what a great one to close on covering general issues of public international law, but also critical approaches, regional. I mean, um, I have a lot to keep thinking about, so thank you.